Understanding creation, uh, are the Bible and science in conflict. Uh, again, we're going through the book Understanding Creation by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. Um, uh, there are 20 chapters which are addressed as uh, answers to questions, and they're intended to be standalone, although uh, for the second week in a row we'll have another, uh, we'll have a <coughs> Uh, chapter that refers to somebody else's chapter. Um, they were originally intended to be 1,800 to 2,400 words. I think that most of them have crept a little bit over that. I know mine did. Um, and this week, it is the question of the week is, are the, are the Bible and science in conflict? And that's uh, written by Dave Ekins. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dave Ekins, he uh, earned his BA and MA degrees from Andrews University, and then he taught secondary school. He then got his PhD here at Loma Linda, and taught at Southwestern for uh, two years, and then went to Africa. Uh, taught four years in Nigeria, six years in Kenya, and then uh, postdoctoral studies in neurophysiology at Andrews, and then went to Kettering, uh, Kettering College of Medical Arts, and then uh, Southern Adventist University. So he's been around quite a few places, including uh, uh, extended uh, time in the old world. Uh, so that's kind of the background with which he addresses these questions. Um, my own view, and I'll just throw it out there, and then we'll look at Ekins himself. Um, he makes a lot of uh, pertinent observations. There's a lot of useful information, I think. Um, the organization strikes me as kind of being organic uh, rather than incisive. That is to say, he doesn't take it and package it neatly. Um, there's some argument that that may allow more freedom to, to make pertinent observations. Um, on the other hand, I don't come away with a uh, 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 I don't want to say coherent because it's kind of coherent, but in a not in a uh, tightly knit style. He starts out with his introduction, and then the discussions of science and faith. One often gets the impression that either science or scripture can be believed, not both. Um, and of course, that's why the question is: Are the Bible and science in conflict? In the secular world, science is by default seen as a true source of knowledge. That's certainly, you know, the, the standard prejudice. Uh, the Bible, if considered at all, is only useful as a source of spiritual insight as long as it doesn't disagree with the standard scient current scientific consensus. I like that phrase. Um, this chapter is examining that question, and then they're going to explore how what do you do if you're both a believer and a scientist? Are they really in opposition? And, and how do you keep yourself from having schizophrenia? The reference on how to deal with tension is uh, uh, chapter 20 by uh, Gary Burdick. Now, <coughs> obviously, one of the first things you have to do is define science, and so he defines science as a systematic process that attempts to explain phenomena in terms of the physical mechanisms that cause them. Now, that's a fairly widespread um, definition of science. I, I'm going to just introduce two others real quickly. One of them is um, uh, one that uh, uh, ex examines phenomena that can be reproduced and tries to organize them in some uh, reasonable way. Um, and the difference between those two is that one can cover quantum mechanics and the other one, at least at present, cannot. Uh, in fact, for most of the life of the of physics, you had things that could be understood in a kind of intuitive way to objects that hit each other, bounce apart, they have the same momentum afterwards, total momentum as they do before, 
that's kind of, you know, standard Newton's laws of something keeps going unless it's stopped. Um, but what was really um, confusing about uh, Newton is that he had this weird force where something over here exerted an attraction over here for no obvious reason. There is no mechanism to account for how, at least no known mechanism for some 300 years. One of the things that um, Einstein did was to create a mechanism. That is, this body here put out a field of warped time space that exerted an attraction on the other body. And um, you know, it's kind of interesting because in quantum mechanics they try to t they talk about gravitons, which apparently are some kind of emanation that comes out of the out of the mass, presumably in proportion to its mass. Nobody says where they go, what, how much they weigh, what they do. Uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, we've solved that problem yet, uh, but. The important thing is that until Einstein came along, there was no mechanism for gravity. It just was. And Einstein solved that problem while at the same time starting the, the uh, uh, theory of quantum mechanics, which uh, said that quanta are real. And uh, by the time you got done with quantum mechanics, you have you have things for which there is no known physical mechanism. It's almost as if quantum mechanics requires uh, an understanding of an observer and what the observer is doing in order to be able to say what's going to happen to a particular particle. And uh, there's no known mechanism for that to work. Uh, so. The definition that he's using actually excludes, excludes quantum mechanics as science, and I don't think most scientists would be comfortable with that. But the other definition that you could use is a science, a systematic process that demands that all phenomena must be understood in terms of physical mechanisms that cause them. Um, that some people will call that scientism. Uh, and the reason I want to point out those two alternative def definitions is because they have, they have an influence on what we mean when we ask the question, are the Bible and science in conflict? Anyway, a miracle is an event that cannot be explained slow, solely by naturalistic scientific means. Uh, he'll go into, maybe that's not quite 100% true, so we'll look at that. But that's, that's his kind of starting definitions. Uh, he talks about the distinction between experimental and historical sciences. In discussing science and faith, it's useful to distinguish between experimental or empirical science on the one hand and historical science on the other. And he mentions physics, chemistry, anatomy, ecology involve the manipulation of things that are right there that you can watch. Um, these science, the sciences that are mainly historical in his examples are archaeology and paleontology study the result of a past event and attempt to explain what occurred in order to produce the observed order. And they're really two different processes according to him. Now, there are those who claim no, science is a whole, science is one, and you can't divide it up that way. I, I think that his division is a correct one. But that's uh, a subject to be explored. Now, as he notes, most scientists actually have both empirical and historical aspects. But you can only experiment on the, exper on the uh, empirical ones. Now, there isn't significant conflict between experimental science and scripture. The problems that you run into is the historical sciences, and uh, the Bible will give a supernatural explanation, and a scientist, as he puts it, attempts to arrive at a naturalistic explanation. And of course, if you define science the way he did, then yes, that is true. Scientists try to see 
if there's a reasonable naturalistic explanation. Well, you know, again, if we get into terminology, is quantum mechanics natural? We don't have a mechanism for it. And uh, in fact, it's arguable that quantum mechanics is a, a daily demonstration of miracle because there is no known mechanism and nobody has come up with a conceivable mechanism yet. As uh, some wag said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, it's evidence that you don't. <laughs> um, then he talks about Bible passages, and um, he goes into uh, Bible does describe scientific uh, uh, things of a scientific nature, even though it's not a primarily a scientific text. Various <coughs> Bible authors mention mammals, birds, plants, aspects of anatomy, physiology, behavior are all mentioned by Bible authors. The Bible describes the, um, my uh, that uh, should be creation of life forms. That's my typo. Implying that God designed and fabricated the living systems available for us to study today, and this is the interesting part. <clears throat> Science today confirms the appearance of design at all levels of complexity, although considerable disagreement exists over the cause of the design. Um, them's fighting words. Uh, they shouldn't be. Uh, Richard Dawkins begins the uh, story of uh, 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 let's see, it's a blind watchmaker by saying biology is a study of complicated things that look like they're designed for a purpose. And if you uh, read the rest of that chapter, he illustrates in exquisite detail the design of bat sonar. It is amazing, and it's almost worth reading the book just to read that description. And you start to get the, the and the, you know, he says, well, evolution can do this. Uh, but if you read the, if you read it and you think, did it really need to be that good in order to keep the bat alive? Um, So he does point out that there is design in nature. He goes on to talk about some passages are written in symbolic terms or figures of speech. Thus one might mistakenly interpret a, a, an expression as literal when it is in fact figurative. And he's arguing for being careful about a wooden uh, interpretation of the Bible. For example, Habakkuk 3.3 says that God came from Teman. Uh, those of you who uh, have forgotten, here's the Habakkuk 3, the first part, so you get a little bit of the context. God came from Teban and the Holy One from Mount Paran, wherever Mount Paran is. Um, and then there's that interesting word Selah, which is simply taken over from the Hebrew, and nobody in the Hebrew knows what it is either. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Where you usually see this is in poetry. And in fact, if you look at verse 3, and if you look at the rest of this, you'll notice that it's structured that way. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Parallel. Then, perhaps musical instruments here. I don't know. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Again, parallelism. Um, and, you, you know, when you see that, you know you're dealing with poetry, and you know you better be a little bit careful about being too wooden about the interpretation. Now, he says, perhaps some people would conclude from that text that God lived in Teman, but most of us would consider this to be a figure of speech, where he says God came from the area where the Ten Commandments were given, and uh, poetic. Now, he keeps going, though, and he says, on the other hand, there are many passages of Scripture that are clearly intended as historical narrative, these include passages such as Genesis 1.11, the Gospel accounts of Jesus' miracles, and his virgin birth, death, and resurrection. So he's saying, yeah, if you want to, you can explain some things away with uh, poetry, but uh, he's not going there with Genesis 1-11. Um, 
he then discusses natural and supernatural explanations. We're able to offer two possible explanations of phenomena or events, natural or supernatural. The two explanatory systems may be in conflict or they may complement each other. So sometimes you'll have it that will go both ways. Uh, explanations of past events are inherently not directly testable. For a given phenomenon that the Bible describes as supernatural, a materialistic or naturalistic scientist may give a naturalistic explanations. In some instances, both explanations may apply. Now, he's not t uh, telling you which, exp which instances they are. Um, I, I guess I, if I were defending this, and, and I think I would, um, I would say that uh, Esther is a good example. There are no flat out miracles in Esther. There's nothing that couldn't have happened given our understanding of physical law. But you get the very distinct impression that there's some kind of guidance that's going on behind the scenes because it's just the chances of, of, of the king being unable to sleep and so they bring the records to, for him to <coughs> read so that he'll at least get something done and maybe he'll get bored and go to sleep again. And then he comes to the passage on Mordecai where Mordecai saved the king's life just at the point where Haman walks into the court. The timing is just too good. The name God does not appear in the book Esther, the only biblical book that does not have a single reference to God. Uh, yes, and uh, also of interest is that the, um, is that the uh, book is one of the two books, I can't remember what the other one was, that's not represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but, you, you know, people look at it and they say, you know, you can say all you want to that God's not represented. But Esther prays, who does she pray to? The things that are described, you read them and you say, there's, a, there's an unseen hand guiding this stuff. You don't have to, and, and I think this is one of those instances where there aren't any laws broken, but you get the feeling that something is going on beyond just the, the simple story. Um, and in fact, because of that, many um, uh, people who uh, don't want to believe in God for whatever reason um, are busy trying to trash the story as not being non-historical. Um, because otherwise, they wouldn't bother. Um, at any rate, in other words, God may well have used ordinary physical processes in a supernatural way to accomplish his will. And I think that's one of the examples that you can give. Um, and he goes on to say many of the great scientists of the past were believers and saw no conflict between the Bible and science. In the um, 17th century, scientists were divided into two camps. And he gives Bacon and Galilee I, on one end who felt that you needed to keep this separate. And uh, this is an interesting uh, reference that uh, has to do with uh, the religion of Newton, uh, where Newton sounds like he's more in the other camp. Um, in the past half century, American scientist Stephen Gould, of course, has gone on to say that, uh, that uh, you really need to separate them completely. Now, I have a problem because I think that uh, Gould doesn't believe in the religious thing anyway, and so. Um, when he argues, uh, what he's basically saying is keep your religion out of my science. And uh, he's really arguing for the scientist's position. Just making it palatable by saying you can keep your stuff as long as it doesn't interfere with reality. Um, but uh, the other group is the pan-sophists who viewed science and scripture as being ultimately in harmony. And I would imagine Newton would be one of those. Uh, both groups arrived at a no conflict answer, one because they never mesh with each other, and the other one uh, that because when they, do, uh, when they do mesh, they in fact mesh. There isn't a conflict. And um, 
We might take the same approach today, he says. So I'm assuming this is kind of his view. With one additional caveat, not, well, not all of our questions will be answered. Since we're in a sinful world and have only incomplete understanding of science and scripture, we will not arrive at complete answers to all questions. And I think that's a fair point, which is why, of course, he refers to Gary Burdick's chapter in the first uh, little bit of his story. Now, he goes on to talk about areas of conflict, so he says you can't really make it to where there's no conflict whatsoever. And he's, he says, in origins, this is one place where you really run into conflict. Those with the naturalistic worldview prefer evolutionary theory because it posits ex explanations in terms of purely physical mechanisms. Those with the worldview based on biblical revelation prefer creation theory because it accepts biblical accounts of supernatural activity in the creation and maintenance of the natural world. That's probably a fair statement. Both views appeal to evidence, yes, because the evidence is so incomplete and open to different explanations, the scientist's worldview comes to play a major role in interpretation. And that's, again, kind of fighting words because, you see, the usual thing is that because they're both open to that explanation, the religious person injects his or her prejudices into the and what he's saying is, no, the scientist projects his or her prejudices into that. Um, we'll now turn to areas where conflict is very, very much in evidence. And um, he goes to Galileo. And um, I think he builds it up more, him up more than I would. Uh, because I would be reluctant to say he's the father of modern physics. I think that that title belongs to Isaac Newton. But um, he talks about... Um, the Catholic Church, um, and um, he notes that this is not strictly a Bible science conflict, but reflected a difference between religious leaders and some scientists on a, over how to interpret the Bible and scientific data. And of course, Galileo has pretty much won the field. Um, and interestingly, his um, reference is uh, a chapter in a book by uh, Ronald Numbers. Um, Numbers is turning out to be much more friendly to um, uh, creationists than I think most people anticipated him being. Not that he's, he is one himself, of course. And um, he says that um, the conflict has always existed between the secular scientists and those who hold a theistic worldview. And go, then goes on to, uh, of course, talk about the war between science and religion and has a reference for that in Jennings. Um, uh, of course, the war has been exaggerated on the secular side, but unfortunately, he says, overzealous Christians share in the responsibility for this conflict. Serious thinkers are often alienated by superstition, suppression, coercion, associated with the dominant church, and that's unfortunately true, and um, it doesn't really matter, well, it may matter a little bit, but not very much, who is the dominant church, if you have a church that has the power to dictate things, I think that we uh, can run into uh, this kind of problem. And uh, it results in distrust of the Bible when it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, the Bible chronicles the occurrence of numerous miracles which are almost invariably interpreted differently by the two groups, the believer or the non-believer. And uh, he defines the, those to, he goes on to say the non-believer arrives at one of the following conclusions, either the, the writer thought it happening but he was wrong, or he, was, he knew he was wrong but he was trying to fool people, uh, I guess for political reasons or whatever, or he wanted to make a point and make a good story and so he told it regardless of whether it was true or not. In any case, the secular scientist has to, well, it, if you don't have miracles then it can't be a miracle, it's that simple. Um, the, in contrast, the person who accepts the Bible as divinely inspired accepts a miracle by faith. And um, that's almost a faith science point of view, uh, except that I would, uh, at this point, I would challenge the definition of science. Um, and he talks about miracles with no available physical evidence. And he gives the example of Jesus walking on the water, and the skeptics say, well, he just knew where the stepping stones were. Um, it's a pretty brave guy to do that in the middle of a storm, but um, whatever. 
and Peter started walking and then fell off the rocks and so had to be rescued. And, um, believers may rightfully, so I presume that he puts himself in the position of a believer in here, regard such explanations as strained, but since there's no direct physical evidence, well, actually there is. Um, the, there's no stepping stones there today. But of course, then, then the skeptic will simply say, if he wants to maintain this, well, it just got knocked over. And then what really happens is that if push comes to shove and you say, but there aren't, it's all muddy everywhere, uh, then, then the skeptic will just simply revert to, well, the guy who wrote it didn't know what he was talking about or lied. Um, or it was a pious fraud, which always amuses me a little bit uh, in, a, uh, in a religion that values honesty as much as uh, uh, Christianity does. I, I have a little trouble with that one. Um, uh, and, and basically, both sides talk past each other because you, know, you believe it or you don't. Uh, it's like Jonah and the whale. There's no whale around like that. Well, it was a miracle. God can do that. Um, but God doesn't do miracles. And, and so there's really no way of settling that argument. A second example he gives is Jairus' daughter. Well, was she really dead? You know, the text makes Jesus almost say, well, she isn't really dead. Of course, how you make people feel that much better suddenly is not clear, but um, he says that the skeptic will just simply say Matthew's and Luke's report are discounted as wrong. And if push came to shove and people were able to show that Jesus was trying to teach something about death, and really uh, Jesus meant to say that, yes, she was indeed dead, but I'm going to raise her up, um, that then he would simply resort to saying Matthew's and Luke's reports are wrong. Now, I'm extrapolating from his, he didn't actually say that, but I think that that's the clear, what happens to, to those kinds of things. And one's response to the account will depend on one's confidence in the reliability of scripture, and that's definitely true. Now, there are miracles with physically observable effects. And uh, he calls these no conflict but issues. Our belief is that the Bible and science are not in conflict. Nevertheless, they do appear to be so. To resolve these issues, evidence must be carefully evaluated as can be interpreted in many different ways. Now, according to a believer, the origin of life on earth is an example of a miraculous event in which the Bible and science are not in conflict. For more than a half a century, numerous experiments have been conducted in an attempt to prove life from non-living material via naturalistic means. Thus far, these experiments have failed to produce empirical evidence for the spontaneous origin of life. Therefore, the believer feels, ah, see, science supports my position. <coughs> um, the non-believer would not be convinced. The absence of evidence is not seen to constitute good evidence. As they would always say, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Well, that's kind of true, except that if I look at this chair right here, I have the absence of evidence that anybody's sitting in it. Um, I think that we can take that as evidence that there isn't actually a person there. Um, that, th th that is a, uh, I think, it depends on what you need in order to make proof. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the absence of evidence can sometimes be evidence of absence. But that's, again, that's going beyond what he has to say. But his point is that you have all this evidence that seems to suggest that life is not created by uh, spontaneously. Uh, and uh, or it does not occur spontaneously, and the believer just simply can buy that. The unbeliever finds ways around it because he has to. Um, and uh, therefore, there is conflict in their minds, and that's an interesting statement because you usually think of conflict as being with the Bible and science. Uh, in the minds of a believer, he's pointing out that there's conflict 
between a biblical worldview and a scientific worldview in the mind of the secular scientist. Not all our problems. Some very subtle points that he's making here. The area where there is no conflict but questions are perhaps the most vexing is the amount of time required for the accumulation of fossil bearing sediments in the Earth's crust. And he goes on to outline uh, Greenland ice cores and uh, um, the uh, uh, most conservative Bible st scholars can't allow for 160,000 layers, <coughs> at least 160,000 years, and I would agree with that. And um, uh, he, he notes that uh, Jackie in particular has a, uh, something available on the web. If you have the book, you can look up the reference itself. Um, and he gives some other examples, and, uh, and he says that Many ex other examples can be given of <coughs> conventional dating techniques that <coughs> suggest the Earth is much older than 10,000 years. Many Bible-believing scientists see no conflict in old dates for rocks. God certainly could have created the rocks of the Earth many millions of years. But there are many examples of fossils found in rocks dated by standard techniques as, long, uh, m as much older than 10,000 years. So there's a problem if you just simply say, oh, we'll just accept the dating m methods for the rocks. <coughs> but uh, try to make the fossils younger. So he um, delves into very, very briefly the problem that we discussed last week. He says the last chapter in age dating has not yet been written. And he, he gives examples of soft tissue that was recently discovered inside fossil dinosaur bones thought to be 67 million years old. And of course, that's Schweitzer. Um, no one has a good idea how it can last that long. Another example is the discovery of the catastrophic nature of the Yellowstone fossil forest, once thought to represent long age of, so of ordinary processes. And of course, that has mostly turned around. And Coffin gives a, uh, uh, an illustration of that. And then uh, he talks about rapid deposition of sediments, including the rapid underwater deposition of turbidites and the rate of erosion of the continents. Um, and uh, he references Ariel Roth here uh, on that one. So uh, it's interesting that he comes back to some of the same uh, uh, ones that I listed uh, in my uh, chapter that was talked about last week. Uh, taking the Bible as myth creates major problems. Um, some people solve the conflict by concluding that biblical miracles are myth. Traditional stories that serve to express a worldview, except that the worldview is intended to say that that kind of thing can happen to us, and if it didn't happen to them, then the transfer doesn't work. Uh, he says, for example, some people, you know, say Daniel didn't really exist, didn't really spend time in the lion's den. It's just a story to make us confident that God will be with us. Again, what do you do with that? Well, this approach undermines the inspiration of scripture. Some people see the ages obtained by conventional dating as so strongly indicating an old earth that they conclude a literal reading of the Bible to be absurd. Such individuals may accept ideas of some biblical scholars who believe that parts of Genesis, for example, chapter one, were written after other sections. And it's interesting his, where he says this pushes people. And it does not, well, it does put, push some people to maintain that the Bible didn't really mean to indicate short ages. But he's noting that, no, what really happens is that they get, most of the time, they get pushed into the idea that Bible didn't know what it was talking about, because this is all written way late. If we take this view of scripture, we might well end up denying Christ's life and ministry. And I would have to agree, because if you go, if you use the method that destroys Genesis 1, and you keep using that method, you eventually come to destroying the idea of the resurrection as well. Because after all, we've never demonstrated that scientifically. Historically, maybe. Scientifically, no. Um, the evidence against the bodily resurrection of Christ is comparable to that used against the literal reading of Genesis 1. 
If we're going to be consistent in our understanding of the inspiration of Scripture, we need to be ready to accept that miracles did occur, and that's one of the most important things, and that using conventional means, we cannot prove how they happened. Thus, the conflict remains. And I think he's starting to zero in on a really important point. Conflict may be unavoidable in some cases. For most believers, it's no surprise for there to be a conflict between faith and secular science. Christian doctrines are based on faith and are supported by evidence that appeals to reason. Notice he's not saying it's pure faith. It's reasonable faith including personal experiment, experience, documentary evidence, and eyewitness testimonies. If, you'd have if you've experienced a miracle in your own life, it's a lot easier to believe that there are other ones. Empirical evidence is also important, but it is not the only factor, as it is in secular science. And that's uh, one of the important things. Um, according to a believer, the origin of life on earth is an example of a miraculous event in which the Bible and science are not in conflict. Oh, wait a minute. Um, that's an extra slide that didn't get deleted. When interpreting a scripture, we must always do so in humility. Are there any other interpretations possible that do not destroy the original meaning? And it's you know, interesting to ask, what is he talking about? Where would he like to use this observation? Um, I suspect that it ha may have to do with the age of the universe proper. We may accept alternate views if the passage allows for them while not losing sight of the event's miraculous nature. The same principle should, be, uh, should apply to interpreting science, a humble attitude in cons consideration of alternative hypotheses. Maintaining this attitude can help keep conflicts between the Bible and science in perspective. So this is one way of lowering the conflict level. But if we are consistent in our understanding of Scripture's inspiration, we must be ready to accept that miraculous events did in fact occur and that using conventional means we cannot prove how they happened. So this is the key here. If you if you accept a miracle, then when something comes, you know, smack dab against, well, you can't explain it, you say, okay, well, I didn't expect to. All we need to really establish is that it happened. Uh, thus, the potential for conflict remains, as it will, as long as the world does in its present iteration. And I would go on to say, as long as, as, long as science does in its present iteration. To conclude, maybe someday we'll know all about that. For the present, we have to live with tension, which for a scientist can be considerable at times. Uh, we will conclude that there will always be some conflict between science and the Bible. Um, conflict between the Bible and science arises for several reasons, including different philosophical understandings of the role of God in nature, the difficulty of interpreting the history of the word, world scientifically, and the ability of science to explain in scientific terms what God did miraculously, uh, that's the whole point of a miracle, is that if you don't take into account God's activity, you're not going to understand it. And uh, if you refuse to recognize God's activity, you definitely won't understand it. And the brevity and incompleteness of the biblical information about the history of nature. And uh, I, I'm going to agree with that. Um, all these questions and conflicts should prevent, present opportunities for scientists and theologians to grow together in their understanding. The tragedy is that both often seem limited by and locked into their own perspective and fail to communicate in a common language. And I would agree on that. Um, that's the chapter. And let me just you know, make a few observations. As I said before, I think it's a good analysis. I think it makes a lot of points. Um, I think the question could have been answered more clearly by recognizing that there are two different de definitions of science, and that's beyond the experimental historical dichotomy that, uh, that Ekins recognizes, and, and that is that um, science as applied naturalism will always be in, as he points out, not complete conflict, 
there will be a large areas where we'll both agree. Uh, most of medicine remains the same, for example, whether you are a, uh, a believer in divine miracles of the most conservative stripe or whether you are a complete non-believer in miracles uh, in God and anything else that, that uh, <coughs> would take God's place. Um, much of science would remain the same. But, it will, but there will be these partial conflicts or, the, or these, these areas where one side will claim one thing and one side will claim another. And it's simply a matter of, you know, the Bible says that this is a miracle. There's no really good scientific explanation for how it would happen without have being a miracle. Um, and science or people who adhere to this particular variety of science can't have miracles. So there will always be a conflict at that point. It's not an accident. It's built in. It's what the basic dispute is over. But science as a study of the reproducible would not necessarily be in conflict with the same uh, 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 religion. And that's why it is critically important um, how you define science and whether science has a built-in atheistic bias in it. And uh, one, one way to say it is science is applied methodological naturalism. Uh, that's an okay definition as long as you recognize that there might be some things that are beyond science. If you insist that science is applied naturalism and that science includes everything, you are no longer a methodological naturalist. You are now a philosophical naturalism. And a religion that believes in miracles is simply out the window if that's correct. On the other hand, if the, it is true that religion that believes in miracles is correct, then your science is inadequate. And with that, I will leave the floor open to uh, comments and questions. Uh, Ariel Roth. Since you were quoted, we'll let you go first. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I tend to agree with my quotations. Um, <laughs> the um, issue here, I think, uh, very well outlined. I like his chapter. I think he's done a good job of the question he asked and so on. And you've talked about uh, two definitions of science. You know, there's all kinds of definitions of science, but this is a good place to start. And uh, are we going to be strictly atheistic, which means, you know, there is no God, or are we going to allow for miracles? Very good. Uh, question See, there, there's, a, there's another, there's a third position, and it kind of fits with this definition that he uses, and that is there may be a God, but if so, we can't study him scientifically. And that's okay as long as you, when you come to a certain area, you say, well, maybe that's beyond the reach of science. Sure. You just, uh, but, <coughs> but you don't say then it's false. That's mm -hmm. the key. Yeah. Because when you say then it must be false, sure. then you've moved <coughs> into that second hard atheist definition of science. Right. Uh, what, what I would like to see uh, entered into the discussion here and I think we've seen it, and I'm getting a little beyond this chapter when I say this, uh, on what's been on the internet lately about last year and so on, is uh, we need to define faith. Uh, we're using that term in various ways, and uh, to some persons it means, uh, you know, pure subjectivity. Uh, Let's uh, face it, there is such a thing as faith in science expressed by naturalistic philosophy. Uh, and uh, if you think you can isolate faith in one category, uh, 
and science in another category, that is not possible. But if you can, uh, I think we need to start uh, thinking of uh, faith as a, what you might call, pure blind speculation. Uh, something for which there's no evidence. Uh, to try and uh, uh, point out, hey, this may not be what we mean when we talk about faith and science. There well, certainly, is Ekins uh, suggests that his view is uh, that faith is does have evidence. For yeah, it. he he came up with that statement, and it seems to me, to, to me, the, the the definition of faith I'm more comfortable with, as far as my practice of thinking is, is that it, it's an extension of evidence, not just pure wild speculation. Uh, and. and uh, we don't like, you know, I can say, well, Alice in Wonderland is true, you know, that, that's a true story. That's pure speculation type of thing, you know. But I can say, no, there's, there's a lot of evidence for um, the flood, for instance, I'll be talking about. Uh, that is, we don't see the, f the flood right now, and it's, you know, and it's, um, it's certainly something extremely unusual. It's an astonishing event, and it's hard for us to conceive of it. Uh, and so on. On the other hand, we've got evidence out there that suggests, uh, and we have, uh, some people have faith as a, in this flood based on this evidence. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we, in this discussion uh, as it goes on, we, we need to uh, clear up definitions of science, we need to clear up definitions of faith. Go ahead. Yeah, I think this is one of the best chapters in the whole book, but there are a lot of good chapters, so I won't discount what others are saying. Um, I know um, Dave Ekins personally on another note, and that's he's an avid bird watcher, and I used to go bird watching with him back at Andrew's days, maybe when you were there, Ariel. He was there then. So he's, he has a lifetime commitment to Adventist creationism, and I honor him and respect him for that. Mm. I wish he had <clears throat> been able to bring a little more uh, down-to-earth examples from biology, which is his expertise. Uh, right next door, we have La Sierra University, and I have here the statement, I think dated October 5. I don't see it on this document, but it was released about then. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the biological wing of La Sierra, it says, in our dialogue, we found a solution to be the teaching of creation as a faith conviction rather than as science. Creation is not a scientific construct. It is a faith construct. The conviction of divine creation lies beyond the purview of the methods of empirical science. So now... They're defining science quite narrowly and cannot be subjected to them. I'm wondering whatever happened to the discussion about philosophy of science. I mean, every scientific view has a ph philosophical background to it. And certainly creation is legitimate when it's within the realm of philosophy of science. <coughs> I'd like your comment or anyone else's comment on that thought. Well, um, the first comment I would make is be careful what you read. Um, it may not be as authoritative as you thought. Uh, I have information that uh, two of the uh, biologists, at least, who uh, uh, are listed as having signed on to that statement, in fact, did not do so. Um, wow. And uh, were at, at least one of them was quite upset. I think both of them were, but I, my sources mm -hmm. are not completely sure on that. Uh, that uh, was quite upset that, uh, in fact, he, uh, uh, you know, that this is somehow underhanded. If he's correct, I'd have to agree with him. Um, 
I am told that one of the board members was handed this statement as a kind of a fait accompli. Look at this, see what you think. Uh, could you could you go along with this? Signed it, and that's it. And um, I have on other information that the uh, that two of the board members that are listed there are have been fired. At I've heard this that too. Point. I because of all of the things that are being said plus or minus on this as to who's in what <laughs> camp and why, um, I'm kind of, I, I almost would say that until I see the documents, you know, I'm not sure I would take anybody's word for anything at this point, uh, you know, unless they were personal eyewitnesses that something like this happened because it's just there's there's too many things where <coughs> mis apparent mistakes are being made where people are uh, have no good excuse for making those kinds of mistakes it's <laughs> almost as if there's some misinformation being s being semi deliberately spread and I have no clue as to by whom uh, my my take on that statement itself is that it's totally incoherent. It's ambiguous. It's ambiguous, but uh, but if you no matter how you try to interpret it, the the pieces can't be put together logically. Uh, Bible is a faith sta statement. Science can't touch it is the emphasis on that particular. I mean, it doesn't finish up by saying, well, we believe in the Bible um, uh, by faith and, uh, <coughs> and, and, and therefore we think that science will fit into the Bible. It finishes up that section by saying, and it doesn't matter what the evidence is, this is what we'll believe. Uh, at least the scientific evidence. Yeah, the last sentence I didn't read. Nevertheless, faith and science can and should constructively interact. And that's the interesting thing, is that when they get done with that first set of boilerplate, they move on to the science boilerplate, which is science should be done without uh, without the interference of faith. According, and then yeah. But and then when they get done, they say that last mm -hmm. sentence and says that they should constructively interact. Well, you know, you can't, you can't mesh those two if you, if you mm -hmm. start out by completely separating them and requiring that the science has to mesh with the current scientific consensus, which is what they're saying. So what I'm suggesting, maybe we should look at <coughs> this from a philosophy of science viewpoint, <coughs> in that you have philosophy of physics, you have philosophy of biology, you have all kinds of views that deal with the broader picture, the world view. <coughs> and certainly with an Adventist creationist world view, you can say, yes, this is legitimate. What we're saying about Genesis 1 is legitimate. <coughs> according to our world view. Mm -hmm. But that almost sounds like uh, if you pick one world view, you can fit everything into it. If you pick the other world view, you can fit everything into it. And they're yeah. both equally legitimate. And why <coughs> should we pick the mm -hmm. faith-based one rather than the science-based one? After all, science isn't that in dealing with empirical evidence, stuff that you can get sink your teeth into, that you can actually experiment with, whereas the faith stuff is kind of, evidence doesn't really matter. See, I don't like the statement because I think that it concedes way too much to the current scientific consensus, which they want to be able to define as science. Of interest, apparently, those on the um, opposite side of, of the belief uh, 
uh, however you want to put that divide, uh, are not happy with it either. Uh, and, uh, you know, it looks like the statement says that this faith-based thing should be taught uh, mm -hmm. in relationship to science, even uh, it doesn't necessarily say in science class. Right. But it says there should be some kind of integration mm -hmm. that, that takes place. And uh, uh, they're not happy with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think one of the th messages I'm coming away with is that this is not a disagreement that can be easily papered over, that there is a huge fissure there, and that Band-Aids like this just aren't going to stick. It's called more than a Band-Aid. It's called a solution. We found a solution. They didn't say the solution, a solution. Well, they think mm. it's more than a Band-Aid. I think they're wrong. <laughs> Interestingly, this was met with a good deal of approval uh, back east at our church headquarters and uh, lauded as a uh, an interesting solution, but I, uh, yeah. uh, I, I think Warren is on to a, a good point here, and that is that uh, the philosophy of science behind what is going on is extremely important it is. and it's totally that's neglected. That's, that's where the real issues are. We need to and realize they filter down into all other aspects. that we work within certain intellectual matrices which we don't question. And uh, the science of, well, when modern science developed, and then I've said this several times here, I hope you don't mind my saying it again. When modern science developed, and I'm speaking of Newton, Galileo, Pascal, uh, Boyle, and so on, these folks were all in a theological matrix. Mm -hmm. God was there, he was honored, he was the one that developed all these laws that made science possible, and the consistency of science was due to God, and to God, and so on. And no one ever objected to no what they were doing. No, no. Now, you know, since about the first century and a half, since Darwin, uh, he kind of changed the, uh, the impetus. Science has rejected God. Uh, God is out of the picture. And uh, science has taken more or less a secular, a pure secular stance. And if you try and inject religion into science, you're no longer a scientist, which is so very different than uh, Newton, for instance. Uh, now, you can do a lot of science either way without God, a lot, of, a lot of questions you can raise and so on. But, but when it comes to these historical questions, uh, and I, I think uh, Ekins did a very a job pointing out how that's just where the issues are. Uh, there, uh, you're, you're being somewhat restrictive when you say there is no God, mm -hmm. uh, and you can't arrive at truth. My wife wants to say something, I better give her this microphone. Thank you. Um, I just, th it, you know, it, it amazes me they talk about empir empirical science you can't call that whole speculative historical science empirical in any way. I don't, I don't understand how they can, in one hand, value empirical science so much and then relegate all of a religion into the area of faith, which is whatever it is, uh, and think they've solved that problem. Okay, do we have a comment over here? No. Uh, we have a comment back there, though. It would seem more consistent to me if they would acknowledge the fact that the facts are facts and that the interpretation of the facts are based on your worldview and that we choose to do science based on a worldview interp by interpreting facts based on one worldview. It's perfectly fine to teach both, both interpretations of the facts, but uh, the facts remain the facts and that science is the effort to explain facts and you can explain them with two different worldviews and we should have no apology for our worldview because it takes in no less faith than their worldview does. So I, I don't see the, where there's a, they have the right to gloss over their faith because they certainly do not have enough empirical evidence to back up their position any better than we have for ours and we should unapologetically point that out and say you choose your set of faith 
your worldview and by that worldview step out in faith to say certain things happen. In Dawkins' case, the first cell came by aliens dropping it off or whatever, if you know that famous quote of his. Um, you know, I, so I don't think we have to apologize, and I think that we should be able to simply state we look at the we look at the facts with our worldview, and we acknowledge the other worldview, and we compare them, and we go on and teach science. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting because Dawkins really outlines the problem very well, and and uh, and Ben Stein picks up on it right away. Is aliens? Well, of course, those aliens would have had to have been evolved evolutionarily themselves. Um, that is precisely injecting the absence of miracle. That is, we will refuse to recognize the possibility of the supernatural here, even as we recognize that intelligent design actually is not an unreasonable hypothesis. Um, and I, I think that it, Dawkins later realized that he gave away the store with that. And he's, he's tried to walk it back. And I'm not letting him. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is they're quite happy with aliens as long as they're not God. That's the bottom line. And once you realize that that's really what's at stake here, is do you believe in miracles or not, and then once you answer that question in the affirmative, then there's a whole bunch of stuff that is claimed as evidence that really isn't. That it's actually interpretation, if you want to put it that way, of the evidence rather than the evidence itself. And that's a, an interesting point because the next chapter is what's the difference between data and interpretation. And I think it's a crucial point. Uh, and and it, it feeds right into this question. Well, uh, next week, I don't know who's going to be on, but we'll, we'll get to one of the chapters. Um, I'll probably go with something like chapter six if uh, I don't get a guest speaker. But uh, I'm leaving that open as a possibility, depending on uh, who we can get that's uh, available and whether this is the week they can come. So we'll see you uh, uh, we'll see you next week.